uh, thank you for attending this evening's school committee meeting. Um, would you all please stand and join me to salute the flag? I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, as you can see, the mayor is not here this evening. He um, got called to a, uh, an emergency public safety meeting, so I will be cheering for him this evening. First item on our agenda is the hearing of visitors. I see that we have two. Is there anyone else that wanted to add their name to this? Seeing none. Okay, Mr. John Talbot. John, come on up. Good evening, John. Okay. Alrighty, here we go. <clears throat> Good evening, Madam Superintendent, members of the school committee. Uh, I'm here tonight to try to clear up a rumor that's circulating. Um, I asked for confirmation on this as far as uh, more administration staff being added at two buildings. Um, if there's any ad addition to the administration staff at this point, it would be very poor use of money. With 15 of my people unemployed, this is a slap in the face because we took the full 14% cut. We understand, though, uh, the times are tough and just uh, not reasonable that the non-certified staff should shoulder the burden of these cuts alone. Other departments have return, returned to full staff, and some are even hiring, from what I've heard. Um, as of September, when, as it rolls around, um, it won't take long for our manpower shortages to show itself. The many needs of our daily operation will be unable to be satisfied as they have in the past. The willingness of people to be understanding will fade quickly. With less manpower, no overtime, we have little chance of keeping the standards we're used to. The buildings and the needs grow every year. The workforce we need just to keep up. Thank you. The list is uh, Mary Jane Pisano. Mary Jane. Good evening, Superintendent Smith and the school committee members. I am the president of the IBAA and TEA, and I am concerned that there are a lot of positions that still have not been called back to our union. We have nine positions that are not filled and two positions in September that will not be filled when they retire. You are hiring teachers, paras, because of the compliance issues, but I have to say that we have time-sensitive and state-mandated reports that have to be dealt with, but you have taken away any support for these issues. I cannot see how any of this is going to be completed in a timely manner. For example, fingerprinting, state reporting, teacher evaluation, payroll, grants, and many others. I am inviting all school committee members to go to the schools and to come to Central and to talk to the administrative assistants. Ask them how their day goes. Ask them what their workload is like. Ask them how it has increased with all these layoffs. In closing, I just want to point out that our union has a residency clause. We are city employees and city residents. And I do not understand why none of us have been called back to our positions. Thank you and good evening. Thank you very much. Okay, the next item is the consent agenda. The consent agenda is the routine business of the school committee. Um, however, at this opportunity, a school committee member is allowed to pull an item out for further discussion or clarification. Um, would anyone like to remove an item from the consent agenda? Mrs. Joyce, which item would you like to remove? Uh, item E, please. Okay. We'll remove item E. So. Can I get a motion to approve um, items 
excluding item E. Okay, any further discussion on that? All in favor? Thank you. Mrs. Joyce, item E, approval of August 5th, 2014, mm -hmm. Safety, Security, Transportation Subcommittee Report. There are actually two sets of minutes in the consent agenda. Agenda One is July 29th and one is August 5th for this uh, subcommittee. The reason that I wanted to read the second set of minutes is due to the fact that our, uh, as well as our net school spending was cut, our, our non-net school spending suffered a, uh, severe cuts as well, which is completely city funded. That covers our transportation needs, our school buses, as well as our crossing guards. And um, it, it had severe impacts on the level of busing service and crossing guard service that we could offer our students. So I'm going to read the second set of minutes that will outline everything that was accomplished during the summer to try to bring our services up to where they need to be uh, for safety, uh, safety issues for our students. So the Security, Safety, and Transportation Subcommittee met at um, August 5th at 6.30 p.m. at the William Arnone School. Uh, the meeting was called to order at 6.33 p.m. and um, Mr. Thomas reported that in response to discussion and suggestions from the July 29th meeting, the following measures, measures have been taken in order to restore buses to the district. We were able to take $10,000 from the MCAS snacks budget and it, that's been, been redirected. Five crossing guard posts have been eliminated and $18,000 in additional funds were identified to bring back one bus. It cost just under $50,000 to have one bus um, brought back online. The transportation officer, 58,000, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minichello. I'm back about five years ago. <laughs> that was the old number. It was You're about right. 49 at 1.90. Yes. Thank you. The transportation officer was able to maximize van usage by sharing some of the vans between schools. She was able to bring the number of vans down to 49 from 52. These funds will be used to restore three buses. There's only about a thousand to two thousand dollar difference between the cost of a van and the cost of a bus. And of course, we can fit many more students on a bus than we can on a van. Community Schools has agreed to pick up the salary of the Adult Learning Center Director for one year, which will free up $125,000 and fund two buses. Bus passes will be needed for some of the high school students. The area is still to be, to be determined. Mr. Thomas then said that the district can now pay for 49 buses in 49 vans, which will maintain the current bus service. Mrs. Joyce asked the status of the request for additional funds from the mayor. Mr. Petronio responded that no request was sent because even if appropriated, it would not go through the city process in time to prepare and publish bus routes by the third week in August. As far as crossing guard assignments are concerned, Mr. Pa Thomas reported that with the following five positions eliminated since the July 29th meeting, there are now 72 remaining crossing guard positions. He has spoken with Lieutenant Mills, Police officers will be used at the Forest Ave and Belmont Street entrances to Brockton High School, as opposed to our custodians, allowing the, di the district to eliminate three crossing guard positions. He went on to say that the officers will be able to direct traffic, something that crossing guards are not expected to do, and will also have their cruisers parked visibly with flashing lights. Mrs. Joyce said that she felt that this would make a better presence as well. The crossing guard position at the Downey School back parking lot was eliminated by blocking off that entrance during arrival and dismissal times, and the position at Summer and Edson was eliminated. Mr. Thomas handed out a list that included six more positions he felt could be eliminated, which would then allow for the district to add one more additional bus if needed during the school year. There was a brief discussion about these positions. Mrs. Sullivan questioned the position at Center and Cary. Mr. Thomas responded that there was a working light at that intersection and only middle school aged children crossed there. Crossing guards are not normally needed at intersections with traffic lights. Mrs. Joyce questioned the position at Copeland and Market because it can be confusing in Summer and Grove because there is heavy traffic there. She asked Mr. Thomas to find out how many children are crossed at that intersection. Mr. Thomas said that these are only suggestions, but he would like to be able to make cuts before the start of the school year. As of today, those cuts have not been made at those intersections. 
Mr. Minichello verified that the non-net budget is in balance and stated that with the necessary buses restored, he felt very good about the news tonight and the manner in which everyone worked together and contributed to the solution. Mr. Petronio said that he spoke with the superintendent and she asked him to voice to the committee her feelings that we have worked really hard to identify funds to bring back teachers and many other positions and she would have liked to, have, to use any identified funds to restore programs and add to our dire need for teachers rather than spending it on buses, which are a city obligation. Mrs. Joy suggested that when the district makes a plea to the mayor, we make it absolutely clear that we have used funds for transportation purposes that we wanted to use for programs for the children. Mr. Thomas said that he and Ken Thompson, director of facilities, have looked at language in the custodian's contract with respect to the assignment of crossing guard positions and that when the time comes, they will sit down with the union president and make the final assignments according to the contract language. Mr. Petroni asked whether the committee thought that Attorney Lennox should be consulted with respect to any allegations that the elimination of these crossing guard positions will compromise student safety. Mr. Minicello said that he will call Attorney Lennox and report back with his response. Mr. Thomas noted, note, noted that we are not compromising the safety of the students. We have saved six bus buses which amounts to over 900 children who will now not have to walk. Uh, on bus routes, Mr. Thomas reported that with the above adjustment, the bus routes will not need to be changed for the next school year. Uh, other business, Mr. Minichello noticed that there are no flashing slowdown lights at the Barrett Russell. Mr. Thomas said that a request was sent to the Traffic Commission in May. It is the responsibility of the city. Mr. Protonio asked whether we needed to request to have the sidewalks painted and Mr. Thomas responded that the city will take care of that. Mrs. Joyce said she has seen sidewalks in other towns that are painted so that they stand out, and she felt that this was a good idea. There being no further business, the, um, the minutes of the meeting will move forward for a vote for the full school committee approval. And the meeting adjourned at 7.05 p.m. Um, just one clarification on that, Mrs. Joyce, which you uh, pointed out, and that is, approximately 900 students who now will not be walking uh, because of the um, um, rolling up of our sleeves in terms of priority, uh, prioritizing. But that's 900 kids in the morning and in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's, it's coming to school and going home. So um, I think that was something that was on our minds and we wanted to make sure that uh, as many kids get to school safely and. Um, we didn't want especially uh, to extend the um, walk zones mm -hmm. in certain grade levels yeah. um, and students who have been younger students who we've been giving a ride on the bus, uh, particularly the kindergartens, um, can still get a ride on the bus. So Absolutely. I, thought, I thought it was, you know, good work that night. So mm -hmm. um, anyone else? No? Okay. Um, motion to accept the report or Madam, did you want to say something, Madam I Superintendent? Say, you know, um, I was not there at that meeting. Um, I, I thank you for sharing my concerns. Um, <coughs> I'll talk about it certainly during our budget update, but every dollar that we're able to use towards things like transportation, which are very important to us, again, are taken away from the instruction of our students and bringing programs back to the classroom, which is our obligation. Um, you know, that being said, one of the things I want to add in our executive team meeting today, when you talk about some of the cuts that have been made, we're going to be looking to the Department of Transfer Transportation with, I think it's called Safe Routes to School, and looking to make sure that we inform the parents about those intersections that might not have the crossing guards that had previously been there, to talk to their children, we'll make sure they have information and literature in their hands, we'll try to get a message out put it on the website, so we will develop a plan to start to uh, inform the parents about some of those changes that they probably have taken for granted a after many years with their children walking in the city. So we're going to ask for the cooperation of everybody uh, as we again you know, deal with uh, another difficult situation for all of us. Great. Um, we need a motion to accept the report. Twenty ninth, two thousand fourteen. Any further discussion? All in favor? Okay. Um, next item under communication. I don't see anything listed, but we'll go to the next um, report of superintendent of schools.
Um, again, I, I do want to um, address uh, comments made uh, during the hearing of the visitors. Um, certainly, this has been a very, very difficult budget season. And the one thing I will say uh, to John Talbot uh, with the custodian union, uh, Mary Jane Pisano with our administrative assistants, uh, the best thing, if anything came out of this, was certainly all of us working together and communicating and having those discussions, and we will continue to do that. If there are things that you're hearing uh, that, that are so-called rumors, I'm always available at all times to any one of you. I think that's been very clear. I do want to tell you how important every part of the Brockton Public Schools is. It is important that we have these buildings uh, clean and ready to go for the children coming into September. And right now, we're struggling with the manpower we have to do that. Mary Jane is correct when she tells you that the work that the administrative assistants are doing uh, has, has certainly increased with the layoffs that we've encountered throughout the district. So make no mistake about that. I, I think all of us understand, and, and I keep saying that when our uh, union presidents come before you, and I want them to continue to communicate, I want them to know how much all of us support what you're saying. There isn't a day that goes by that we're not looking for an extra dollar. Has a grant come in? We had our executive team meeting today, and right away we bring down Laurie Silva. Any movement on the grants? And, and when there's not necessarily going to be a grant for additional custodians. But as I've said before, as we get to look at grants, we might be able to shift money around and continue to bring people back. Uh, on a positive note, one of the things that you've allowed me to do is presently up to $300,000 as we continue to identify funds, we can bring people back. Tomorrow, we'll be back to the drawing board. We are continually identifying, and, and some good news is we've started to identify funds as people have retired or our early retirement incentive as we start to hire. And some of the teachers that we're hiring are less expensive than some of those that have left us. There's been some other cost savings that, that we've been able to realize that we will start to look at, again, the priorities that you have set forth. But I will tell you, this is minimum staffing levels. And when I mention that, you know, when John Talbot speaks about the custodians and schools up and going, he's correct. We have issues in the schools where I left Central tonight, it was pitch black. I'm not sure if there was anyone there. I think somebody comes in to lock up. We're shutting lights off. We're making sure things are put in barrels. I mean, everybody is suffering. But we will, again, look at minimum staffing levels as we go to open school, you know, which September is two weeks away. Same thing with our administrative assistants. One of our priorities when we talked about children in the schools is to make sure we have two schools without administrative assistants presently. We don't have a greeter you know, at central administration in the form of you know, our administrative assistant that, that deals with many things that come through that door every day. Our parent information center is dealing with you know, all kinds of registrations and again, we're deficient in staffing. So I want the public to understand and again, I thank the school committee because this has been a difficult process. We continue to try to evaluate our budget situation. I will be back at the table tomorrow with our leadership team to look at that. But the other thing that I want to say to you, one of the things I'm watching very carefully, and before school opened every year, you put aside money because we're not a, di a district where we left in June with a certain amount in our enrollment, and it is pretty much the same come September. So we're looking every week at our enrollment in the schools, um, looking at class sizes, and when we get very close to September, we have to start making some decisions if there are some classes that if they go beyond 30 students, I need to be coming back to you talking about the number one priority are those children in the classroom. They only have one time in a first grade, and a first grade with 25 or 30 students is pretty much unacceptable if we're gonna call ourselves a school district. So again, I, I thank the union presidents for coming forward. I want you to continue to do that. If there are things that you call so-called rumors, you know, you have to understand if a grant comes in and it allows us to hire an administrator for the grant, that's what we do. But you know, make no mistake about it, when you talk about administration, there are, we'll talk about it tonight with the strategic plan. We'll talk about it with our district review. We also do have priorities in our administrative team to make sure that we're able to address concerns of that district review that'll be presented to you tonight and to move the district forward with our strategic plan. But again, I, I can't say it enough that every one of you is important um, and we will continue till the last dollar can be found and beyond that 
to make sure that the people that have been dedicated and teach our kids, make sure the buildings are clean, make sure we can all do our jobs and run our schools, you know, we'll be back. And, and that's really what I can say to address, to address those concerns. You know, on that note, um, you know, your words certainly um, are heard. We, um, you know, we unfortunately have tried to make the best out of a very bad situation. And everybody knows that not only have we lost um, staff, but we've also lost programs that have been with us for a long time. Um, so it's not only staffing that we've lost, but we've lost services that we valued and provided to students. And um, so none of us up here are happy about this situation. We certainly sympathize. And um, some of you in the audience know I've had conversations with some of you that um, the school committee and the administration is continuing to try to find funding and money um, to bring back people and most certainly programs for kids. So we will continue to work um, on, you know, on my tenure on the school committee. I can tell you that um, I've never had more meetings in one season than this season. Um, and that's what we've all signed up for and we're willing to do it and we will continue to do it. Um, so, you know, we are working to try to bring people back, to try to bring programs back, and we do, just like the superintendent said, value your contributions because it takes a whole lot of people in different roles to make a solid school system, which we all know Brockton is, and we want it to continue. So um, we don't minimize your roles. Um, we will continue to work, you know, with the superintendent and you know, hopefully bring everyone back. It's just um, a matter of as the dollars come in, um, they seem to be trickling in and not at the rate that we would all like it to. Um, so we'll continue to work hard. That's all I can say at this point. Anyone else? I just want to add uh, to all of you that this past week, um, I had a, a lengthy conversation with uh, Jay Condon, our Chief Financial Officer, and Aldo Petronio. We're back to the board to look at Schedule 19, things that are impacting urban centers, gateway cities, so we can be that district that advocates throughout the state with, with things that are fair for our students. I have uh, an opportunity to go before the City Council, rescheduled from the 21st of July uh, to August 18th, Monday evening where again we will continue to send our message to the City Council about what we need to continue to support our students in their learning, you know, every student, every family, to make sure that we're giving them the best that we can give them in our large urban district. Um, we're going to be talking again about our plans going forward this year, working with our legislative delegation, and, and as I said, the, the budget is uh, never far away from our thoughts each and every day that we're doing our work. So that, that is our budget update. And uh, I think that leads nicely into um, what tonight is all about. And tonight is actually the start of my second year as superintendent. I love being not a new superintendent, um, and, and it feels like I've been here forever. It's, it's kind of, as Mr. Minicello said, um, I've sat here for a lot of years. I've certainly looked at what happens in the school district but I don't think anything could have prepared me for, and, and I think we did great work. You know, we started to address policies. We have bargaining with all of our, you know, unions. Um, we have, you know, dealt with a very difficult budget. We continue to, to communicate to all constituencies, parents, et cetera. So as I start my second year, it, it was interesting because in my new superintendent induction program, and Dr. Jim Marini is here with me this evening, we would talk about other small districts that would do their strategic plan within a couple of months. And I'd say to Dr. Marini, you know, we're, we're still doing the transition and, and now we're doing the entry and in a bigger district and by far we were the biggest district represented in that new superintendent induction program. So it feels very good that it's okay that it took a year to do all of that planning, to take the time that we did for transitioning, for entry, and in the middle of all of that, many of you know, that one month or two months into office, I received a phone call in October of 2013 telling me that the Brockton Public Schools was up for a district review. Of course it was. So at that point there, I truly tried to push it off 
and I wanted, with all of the things we had going on, I thought maybe after the first of the year, I had a long conversation with Ava Mitchell from the DESE, and, and she was right in bringing the district review to the forefront very soon after that. It really helped us work with the DESE to take a look internally at what was happening in the Brockton Public Schools, and it could inform our strategic plan going forward, and that is exactly what has happened. You have actually had the final document from the district review, it's a very public document, since I think late February or early March. I know you've had opportunities to review it. I put it in the packet again this week to kind of refresh your memory. Um, Ava Mitchell is no longer with the DESC right now. She is going on to continue and finish up her doctorate. We wish her well. Uh, we do have Laura Rashane here with us this evening from the DESC, and our plan is for uh, Dr. Ethan Cancel to share with you the findings of our district review, what the process was, what were some of the strengths that were found in our district that we're very proud of, what are some of the challenges that were found that we will deal with head on, and it also, again, informs what we will then share with you tonight, which I'm most excited about, is the uh, unveiling of our strategic plan going forward. So um, I'd like to bring down uh, Dr. Cancel. Uh, Laura, would you also please join us? And we will start with the district review. I'm going to move. All right, good evening. I'm uh, challenged to keep this under 15 minutes. We'll go for it. We uh, do request, if you have any questions about the district review, about the process, Laura's here to address them, but other than that, to hold all questions until the uh, unveiling of our strategic plan, because you're gonna see that most everything is directly addressed in that plan. But this is, the overall purpose of the district review. The, this is the department's uh, take on it. Their goal is to give an objective analysis of how the district systems impact teaching and learning, and the hope is they will make, as a result of the uh, analysis, some suggestions to improve. Just in terms of the scope of the district review, it happened November 18th through 21st. There were about 30 hours of interviews and focus groups. It involved an awful lot of people, 83 people, including some of you on the school committee and teachers, administrators, parents, students, you name it. It was at the elementary, middle, and high school level. You saw focus groups. We had the teachers union involved. So I think the most impressive part is they were in 125 classrooms in all of our schools. So it was, it's a very in-depth process. They also base it on a very uh, deep analysis of data. They look at all kinds of data. They look at student achievement data. They look at school data. They look at our district financing and staffing data. They look at tons of documents, tons, Laura, and you know, all of our curricular documents. They really look at a lot, and they looked at um, our evaluations. So it's a very comprehensive review. And this is sort of, this is not my slide, this is the state slide, but I think it does a nice job of laying out how this whole thing uh, fits together. There are these different pillars or whatever um, they're referred to, but leadership and government is, is, governance is one, curriculum and instruction is another, assessments another. They look at all these different components, human resources and professional development, student support services, and then financial and asset management, and they're trying to see, they've outlined conditions for school success, they being the state department of elementary and secondary education, and a district's job is to put these conditions into effect. And so the, the whole review is, how do all these components work together to further that, the conditions for school effectiveness? So, on to the strengths, and there were quite a few strengths, I'm not gonna read all the slides, but I will summarize the big points. One of the things that they commended us for was under uh, the new superintendent at the time, now the uh, no longer new superintendent, but the uh, veteran, Kathy Smith. That's supposed to be funny, no laughs, okay. Um, 
with Kathy, thank you. They were commend, we were commended for an open and collaborative process to engage all sorts of constituencies to define a new vision and direction. And Brockton High was also commended for its fabulous work at improvement and the results it's garnered. On the curriculum and instruction side, they uh, gave a tip of the hat K through eight to the math and ELA for the great work they've done on aligning the curriculum to the new frameworks. They also uh, noted our K through 12 writing initiative. One of the things that did not escape their notice, like almost every visitor I've ever brought to the Brockton Public Schools, they always talk about the positive and respectful climate in the classroom, and that just stood out in this review as well. On the assessment side, they were impressed by, you know, we have a very comprehensive system, we have a nice data part to it, and it's, um, we, we definitely use assessment data to drive improvement. They also pointed out that we had done a nice job to, to improve the infrastructure. Dan and his crew has, have really done a nice job to get our technology infrastructure up to speed. So that was, that was good, and to use that um, infrastructure to help with data analysis and to get that information to uh, teachers. On the student support side, they noted our um, partnerships. And on the financial asset management, they said um, we had taken some innovative steps you know, with our green initiatives and also trying to save money with our health insurance. So now the challenges. Now I have to remind you, as Kathy had reminded you earlier, and as Ava Mitchell and everyone on the re review reminded us, this is a snapshot, so it's only during that time period that the review took place. So if some of these things are no longer applicable, they're no longer applicable. And in many cases, you'll see that. But um, during the review, they mentioned as a challenge that we had not yet fully um, implemented the Edival system, which we knew, and that's why Superintendent Smith made it a top priority that 100% of the staff, 100% of the staff would be evaluated under the new system. We're very happy to report, yes, that happened, you'll hear more about it, but at the time of the review, that was ongoing and it had not happened. And also, we had not fully aligned all curriculum K through 12. So that was noted. They noted that we hadn't established a common vision of effective 21st century instruction, and you're gonna hear all about that in the strategic plan. And obviously, if you, don't, if you haven't articulated that very good definition, it's very, and you don't have an evaluation system that's as effective as it could be, well, it's gonna be very hard to give feedback. So <clears throat> that shares, you know, that two and three feed into each other. The fourth one is important to just pause a little bit on because this came up in several places in the review and they were concerned about the instructional practices and also some other what I'll call structural issues around supporting ELLs and students with disabilities. They may have been addressed later and they're certainly um, high priorities for us, but at the time of the review that caught their eye. There was some concern in, in the walkthroughs. Now again, it's, it's not a walkthrough, an observation in class. You don't get to see the entire class, but they were in a lot of classes. They didn't see the sorts of opportunities for higher order thinking consistently in all the classes. And while they did note that we have a lot of technology, the, inf the instructional technology wasn't being maximized for, to enhance teaching and learning. So that was something they noted and also, again, at the high school in particular. It was English and math. It was incomplete, the alignment of our courses to what the new frameworks are. On the assessment side, while they noted that we had so many great things, they said, but you don't have the common planning time except at the middle school to really work with getting this stuff out and you're not while you have it all, there's not a ton of evidence that it's being used in a formative sense every day in the classes, so you have to work more on that. Now, they put human resources and professional development together in one bucket. In Brockton, we have human resources and we have professional development in the Office of Teaching and Learning. Human resources is in the HR department, so it's a little bit different, but basically they told us again about 
that we hadn't done the Eddie Val, which we know and we were working on. And um, <clears throat> the other big part of this, number 12, was that our professional development wasn't as aligned as it could be with our priorities in our district improvement plan. And it just wasn't as well coordinated as possible. And you're going to hear tonight how we've taken some really nice strides to fix that. There were some issues, again, as I mentioned, about, uh, especially with the students with disabilities, that they may not be sufficiently supported by professional development, which we're talking about improving it, but also the advantageous class sizes. Put simply, Brockton's class sizes are large, you know that, and for students with disabilities and English language learners, they're large for the, them in particular. And then the other thing that they pointed out was our discipline code, which again, that that has been changed. There's a major law that has gone into effect, which is going to change everything, but they were concerned about the amount of time that students were out of school because of suspension, so that was noted. The financial and the asset management piece, this is a, a little less, I don't want to say accurate, but it's, it's the findings were correct and incorrect in that Aldo files an amendment so that he meets the, the funding stipulation. At the time, they didn't see that amendment because it wasn't filed yet, so they can only report what they see. So you don't have to worry about that, but what there was a process that they pointed out, which you've lived through now, and you know that that's no longer the case, but they said that it wasn't as transparent, and they also said it wasn't so clear how we linked the goals to the budget development, how we developed our budget. This year, I think we've had a very, very transparent and very exhaustive budget process. And so I think that was perhaps accurate at the time, but not so accurate now. 17, though, is, is very appropriate, and we're going to hear more about that as well. And we did not have a long-term plan for capital needs for buildings and equipment. We know what's facing us in terms of population growth, and we also know our aging plants. So that was a very um, important finding. So given those strengths, given those challenges, they made some recommendations. And again, it's, it's really nice to see all the ways that we've responded to this report. So it's a logical recommendation. If you don't have a strong vision, well, get one, put one together, and do it in a collaborative way, and you're going to hear all about it tonight. On the curriculum and instruction side, once you have that vision, then you know you need to articulate it, and um, you need to al align your entire curriculum K through 12. On the assessment side, they basically said get the common planning time and really work hard to uh, get the uh, formative assessments informing instruction on a regular basis. So, and then we go on to um, the HR and PD. So we needed to figure out the Eddie Val rubrics and to work hard fixing our PD and just make it, it we have good stuff, but to make it really align more coherently. And then on the student support side, to make sure that we're putting all the things in place to ensure that the instruction, the PD, and all the interventions meet the needs of all students, especially the students with disabilities. Now, I put this slide up here. I just wanted to talk about the process and underscore what the superintendent had mentioned earlier. When we found out we were doing or having a district review, like she said, we weren't thrilled, but we said, okay, how do we make the most of this experience? And so the district review comes in, they, they, it's, it's a bit of work, but you know, they come in, they do their stuff, and then they, they get together, they write up an initial draft. They, actually, before that, they have these emerging themes. And so Kathy and I sat in her office and we spoke to the associate commissioner who's in charge of the office and some of her colleagues, probably Laura, and um, we went over the initial emerging themes and initial impressions. We correct, you know, factual things like, you know, no, there's an associate principal at the high school, not an assistant, whatever those little details are, we correct those things. 
but we also, if we hear of something that just doesn't sort of ring true to us, we flag it and the um, people from the state go back and they make sure that they can really support with more than one piece of evidence any sort of claim they're making. And so it's a very good, very detailed, and unfortunately for us, very lengthy, because you know, invariably you call it you know, 4.30 and you know, at 7.30 or 8, you're hanging up. But so after that, they give an initial draft and the executive team combed through that executive, you know, the, uh, the draft, we made sure that everything seemed to be right. We don't have to agree with everything, but we want to point out any errors and inconsistencies. So then I got on the phone and I talked a lot and I have to commend uh, this group. They were really, really good about going over all of our concerns, all of our corrections, and uh, then they issued the final report. After that, we wanted to maximize this experience, so Kathy met with Ava Mitchell, who's the associate commissioner in charge of the office, and we talked about this next steps meeting. That's what they call it. And so we said, yes, we'd like to do it. And so we get together, the, the uh, folks from the department, they facilitate the meeting. And in that, you identify the priorities from the plan, and you develop an action plan which, and now for our feature presentation, that's really, this is really, I, I'm very happy to say, because I, I actually was part of an early um, rendition of this district review. I used to do that as a job. This was a new piece to really work with the department, and you're gonna see that our plan really does address all of the concerns that they raise, and I think actually goes beyond it. So without further ado, I think I kept it to the limit. Any questions? Uh, as uh, Dr. Cancel stated, we wanted you to, to hold any of your questions on the review itself. We do have Laura here. Uh, I again thank her and thank the department uh, for really working very closely with us and spending Lots of hours beyond that 29.5 <laughs> hours. Um, so if you have questions about the process at all, um, certainly now would be the time to, to speak to Laura while she's here. Great job, Laura. Great job. <laughs> okay. We, um, I think our ELL population and special ed um, have certainly been a topic for discussion. And over the last, um, I would say, couple of budgets, um, Mrs. Joyce can vouch for that. We've added uh, positions. Um, we've tried to fill certain gaps with respect to those populations. Um, every year consistently we've been adding special education positions, ELL positions. Um, but one thing that I think the department needs to recognize is that, um, you know, Brockton, like other gateway cities, is faced with a larger percentage of these populations so it takes more funding in order to meet the needs of all these students so that that's something you know that I'm sure you know but you know we would hope that um, when you speak to the powers that be you know we're open to the challenge but you know as you previously saw you know we just had a significant layoff you know a 5.7 million dollar gap in our budget so the reality, what we would like to do is different from the financial reality that we have. Um, so, you know, we, we, you know, we're trying to make the best of, uh, again, like I previously said, a bad situation. Um, and some of the decisions that we've made, um, rightly criticized previously by the people that were here, are to try and preserve the classroom, are to try and keep these classroom levels at a quote reasonable um, number of students and we want to do better I mean we, we're not happy with what we're doing we want it to be smaller um, the superintendent and I visited and other people in the district uh, when we were looking to um, perhaps expand our foreign language um, availability um, other districts and you know Milton is one of them that stands out their class sizes are significantly smaller than Brockton's um, and these are kids that do not have the issues that many of our students deal with. So, you know, we're willing to step up to the challenge, but 
the reality financially of what we have is you know, we're all just trying to do the best with what we have. So, I think one of the things that sort of made me feel better is when the review comes in, they're just stating it like it is. And so it's, it's a little prod because it says this is what you have and this might be the norm across the state. This is the norm, this is what you have. And so it, 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 it points to exactly your point. We need money because <laughs> we have these populations that other people don't have. And yes, our class sizes are large. We're aware of that. And now we have the state itself saying that our class sizes are large. So it actually, we can use that as support. So I, I looked at it that way, but it's, you know, all your points are, that's right on. Aren't you going to make a joke about this, Ethan? I can. <laughs> I wish I could. Anyone else? Mrs. Joyce. Um, just one additional question on, on what Tom brought forward. It's great that we have this feedback from, from the Department of Ed, and we can identify things that we can improve upon. But given the circumstances that cities such as us, gateway cities, that we do have unique um, situations that many other communities don't face. Does the DESE utilize any of that information, such as our additional ELL learners, to be able to look at how the funding mechanisms work at the state level? So your questions are very well taken, thank you. Um, you know, I, I need to say that I, I represent the office that conducts these district reviews, and we do communicate quite frequently with other parts of the department, but I'm actually not um, someone who can really speak <laughs> very clearly to answer your question in terms of how the funding um, formula works and sort of what the different factors are that the department well, looks is at. The information but shared at absolutely, all? absolutely. I can tell you that um, folks, including um, senior officials at the department, do read these review reports very carefully, um, and I can I can certainly convey um, your questions and your concern uh, back to the department. And I would just like to commend Superintendent Smith and the school committee for. Um, really valiantly facing a very serious challenge, and it's clear that your priorities are exactly in the right place, um, and I'm uh, grateful that we are able to partner with you in sort of looking at the situation in the district. Um, Thank you. I also answer the question, um, as Laura stated, when we go to our monthly urban superintendent meetings, many of the op offices are represented, and there is talk, you can imagine, with all of the urbans you know, talking about the challenges that we're facing. Um, and, and certainly, I think they, they look to us if there is grant money available or additional opportunities. But this is talk that goes on every time we meet about the difficulty that all of us are facing in urban centers, and especially gateway cities with populations, uh, growing populations such as ours and diminishing budgets. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for having me. Do this next. Oh, okay. All right. So next item is your strategic plan. Okay. Okay, uh, so again, we're very excited tonight uh, as a school district, and make no mistake about that, that's what we are. We are a very strong, unified school district, uh, a district that is facing challenges and moving forward. And I hope as you look at even our opening, one of the things I have seen in many districts uh, in, in my travels, um, and I think about wherever we go, Brockton educators are held in high esteem. Many times they're presenters at conferences. 
you know, they look to our district to see some of the best practices happening, you know, for, for many years. And one of the things that always stands out, if you think about even our Department of Education, there is a logo that defines every time they have a work product. You go to some of the larger district and there's a logo that really defines what the district is, what they believe in, and defines their work products. So I hope as you look up there, uh, and as the school committee uh, hopefully will accept our strategic plan going forward, that is our new logo that we're presenting to you. Over in the corner, we're talking about instructional excellence for every student, every day, the Brockton Public Schools. And when I first saw the logo, we had looked at designs from kids, we had looked at a number of designs. When I looked at this, I loved it. It felt like us. You look at the adult in the picture, you look at the student, whether that's the teacher, whether that's the custodian, the administrative assistant, the para, the MTA, the parent, all of those things support that child to make us the school system. The funny thing that I didn't see right away, and, and I think this is one of those tests, I didn't see the B. So I hope all of you, when you're looking at it, see the B in our <laughs> logo for the Brockton Public Schools. Just to set, um, again, for tonight's presentation, I'll talk about some acknowledgments. Um, we'll talk about the history and the process very quickly of developing this plan. We will talk about our vision, our mission, and most importantly, our theory of action as to how all of this is going to come together. We have identified three areas of focus with that comes a number of strategic objectives, strategic initiatives to support those objectives, and in the end, really the biggest part and the hard work are the action steps to make that happen. Thanks, Liz. For acknowledgments, there are many, but one of the things I want to bring to your attention is years before, when you've had strategic plans developed, Many times there is support from, from outside, from uh, other consultants, uh, from universities, et cetera. Although we certainly had support when we talk about the transition plan with internal and external stakeholders, I shared that with many of you during the entry planning, this strategic plan was developed in-house. It was developed by your administrators, your teachers. And I'd like to make sure, again, that, that when we look at the acknowledgments up there, you know, our school committee is a part, our mayor, our political leaders, my deputy superintendents. You see Mary Beth McManus up there. Mary Beth, many of you know, I've worked with for years. She truly is my mentor in the Brockton Public Schools. And when I tell you she has donated hour upon hour of working with us, supporting some of our strategic meetings, uh, I kid, I don't know if many of you know this, but, but Mary Beth owns a home on Block Island and a business on Block Island, a wonderful ice cream shop. And I feel bad because she spent probably a lot of her summer here in Brockton, and I want to thank her for donating all of her time and supporting all of us, as many of our retirees do. So, Mary Beth, you know, thank you from the bottom of my heart for all you do for the kids and the families in the Brockton Public Schools. Um, again, uh, Richard Bath, my transition team chair, my executive assistants who, again, have been working all year long with a new superintendent, uh, never lose their focus and continue to, to support us in the work we do. All of our directors, our curriculum coordinators, our strategic planning teams, which are made up of our teachers, our administrators, Kim Gibson from the Brockton Education Association. These people have been there every step of the way as we present this to you this evening. Our parents and community members, many of them came out in droves during that transition time planning to share some of their thoughts about the direction and the vision that they want to see for their children in the Brockton Public Schools. Our uh, business and community leaders that took time. Our students at Brockton High School. You've heard me talk about that student voice. Um, I'll be sharing with you tonight. It is something I will continue to do with the students. Uh, and last but not least, again, you've heard me mention uh, my uh, coach with the new superintendent induction program, uh, Dr. Jim Marini, who also has worked very closely with me in uh, doing the strategic plan. So looking at um, the history and the process, we started out, uh, I can't believe it's over a year ago, with doing a listening tour. Uh, we went to uh, over 500 people attended those listening tours. Our transition team and our four subcommittees. And if you remember back then, our subcommittees were teaching and learning, culture and context, organizational efficiency, operations and finance, where we did the, the work of internal and external stakeholders 
talking about what was good about the Brockton Public Schools, what they thought some of the challenges were, what they thought the strengths were, and sharing all of their thoughts and ideas. I mentioned the youth voice, our parents, our district review that you just saw a presentation about all of the information that was gained from our review. I presented in early May the entry plan and will now uh, present to you our strategic plan. I'm proud to tell you that, and this was not easy, you would think that coming up with a vision is, we, we went through so many renditions of what our vision would be. But we've come up with something very simple, it's part of our logo, and it is all about instructional excellence. And when we say for every student every day, I hope you're thinking of the talented and gifted students. I hope you're thinking of the special needs students. You're thinking of our bilingual students. You're thinking of our gen ed students. It's all about instructional excellence for every one of those students from the time they come to us as a preschooler until we can graduate them in 12th grade and many times they come back to us. So it is all about that every day. That's the message. And when I share these things with you, the one thing that I want to be able to do with the school committee is every time we open our school committee meeting, whether it's a subcommittee meeting, whether it's our public meeting, is to talk about what is our vision, to open up and say to everybody, we believe in a vision of instructional excellence for every student every day. What is our mission? Our mission is the Brockton Public Schools ensures students' success by how? By fulfilling the educational the social and emotional needs of all students in that pursuit of instructional excellence. Now this is very particular to Brockton. Other districts, again, might not be looking at some of the things that we need to look at with the type of students that comes to our doorstep, sometimes very new to the country, sometimes in transition from one home to another. We continue to talk about those challenges, but nobody does it better than the teachers and the staff of the Brockton Public Schools. A theory of action. A theory of action is an if-then. So what we state to all of you is if the Brockton Public Schools implements a system of instructional excellence, and if we deliver to you common core line curriculum in a safe and supportive environment for all students, if we value a strong system of growth, and, and I want that word growth to be there, by consistently supporting the Brockton Educator Growth and Evaluation Network begin which is our uh, accelerated ed eval plan that we implemented this year. I am very, very proud to tell you with the hard work of all of our staff, our human resources, Dr. Moran and her office, we will deliver 100% of our educator evaluation ratings to the DESE very soon when we complete the superintendent's evaluation. So we will be there with 100%. If we provide all students and teachers with access to quality instructional technology that improves digital literacy, which is what is happening for our children. This is important in every one of our classrooms. So if then, we will ensure our students are socially, emotionally, and academically prepared to succeed in a global society. We went back and forth and struggled over the word succeed or to be competitive. We felt it was important, although our students are always competitive, we need them to succeed in a global society. The areas of focus that we'll talk about this evening. Our focus is on instructional excellence, number one, in providing a supportive environment and our community engagement. So a supportive environment, the Brockton Public Schools is commi committed to the physical safety and emotional well-being of all members of our school community. Many times you've heard us talk about safe and supportive schools. You've heard us talk about trauma-sensitive schools. We continue to look to support our students in all of those areas. Our instructional excellence, the Brockton Public Schools will incorporate 21st century instructional and assessment strategies to deliver an aligned curriculum in service of what we're doing, our mission is college and career readiness for all our students. And our community engagement. The Brockton Public Schools will engage families in the community at large by communicating in linguistically and culturally appropriate ways to support the academic, social, emotional, and behavioral success of our students. 
our approach in a strategic plan is we'll unveil to you tonight our strategic objectives under our large focus areas. In order to get to those objectives, we'll talk about what our initiatives will be, and as I said, most importantly, our proposed action steps. The plan being developed in a collaborative and interdepartmental and inclusive manner. It is subject to development, refinement, and revision, and I want to clarify that. Tonight is the beginning. We will have, within the next month, our retreat that we have every year, end of August. I'm hoping to do sometime in September based on some of the things happening with our school committee and the needs of the district. When we do that after tonight's presentation, this strategic plan will be vetted with our principals that are coming back next week. We'll continue to work with a number of our departments about their proposed action steps. We'll be introducing this to our teachers on opening day about, again, our marching orders as far as our strategic plan. It is something that is always going to be up for development, refinement, and revision. And when I say that, people come before you and they'll say to you, it's a three-year strategic plan. It's a five-year strategic plan. What I'm offering to you tonight is our plan based on some of the concerns that you just brought up with the district review. We have a difficult budget. That doesn't mean we don't forge ahead. That doesn't mean we don't set a direction, a vision, a mission. That doesn't mean that when we do set our budget priorities, all of this will come under the umbrella of our strategic plan. But again, we will continue to refine it and we will continue to revise it uh, as necessary. And what I also uh, want to say to you is my vision of that is making sure that once the school committee accepts the strategic plan and we develop our district improvement plan, we set those benchmarks, our action steps, people and resources that are needed and timelines to accomplish our goals. This is something that when I come before you and we talk about every time the superintendent does their presentation on teaching and learning, I will give you an update on the strategic plan. So you'll hear, as far as the timelines, the things that we are accomplishing as we're going through. I don't want it to be something that collects dust. I also want it something that is spread widely. When you go into every school, I want you to see that strategic plan for the parents, for the community, for the school committee, for anyone that walks in. That is how the Brockton Public Schools operates. And I guarantee you, after we continue this for a number of years with our revisions, our refinements, people will understand that that's how we operate as a school district and a strong school district. So our strategic objective on number one, I'm going to turn that over to Deputy Superintendent Liz Barry and uh, she'll start to share. Okay. So within the area of instructional ex ex excellence, there's a series of strategic objectives and initiatives that relate to the Common Core alignment. Um, and as Superintendent Smith said, that's going to be a huge part of our plan moving forward. Um, it is also something that we were recognized um, within the district review is something that we, uh, there was areas of strength depending on the level and also areas of need as far as moving forward with the curriculum alignment at the Common Core with Common Core. Um, our main role right now is to equip students with the knowledge and skills that they need, whether they are going to be work ready or going to college. And the other thing that we need to do is make sure that we are providing them with the opportunities and experiences, much like the ways in which they learn outside of school. Um, and by that we mean we're, we're expanding things to look at digital literacy, we're, we're looking at digital curriculum, what kinds of online assessments, formative assessments can we provide to students where they are actually engaged in taking an assessment on the computer. Um, we have definitely laid the groundwork for this kind of work, but um, we have lots of work to be done um, in making sure that our, our curriculum is aligned to the Common Core State Standards K to 12. And as I said, each one of the focus areas has strategic objectives as well as strategic initiatives. That is how the plan is laid out. One of the things that we need to make sure that we're doing is that we are giving students opportunities to take rigorous assessments at the district level so when they actually engage in a state assessment, um, they are going to be prepared for that type of assessment. They're going to be ready for that assessment. Our instructional practices, we need to make sure that we are promoting higher order thinking and problem solving with students and that 
the ways in which we are um, asking students to articulate their thinking, articulate multiple answers to problems, um, that those are the opportunities that we are giving them um, within the classroom. One of the things that we will do is we will begin to think about what are the professional development um, opportunities for teachers to promote those kinds of instructional practices within the classroom. And the in, it, professional development will be for teachers but also administrators because there is a role in supporting these practices but also monitoring them at the school level to make sure that they are happening. A strategic objective uh, two develop a system of identified best practices at all grade levels based on high quality instruction uh, and formative assessment. Uh, we're going to, first of all, continue to implement our uh, Brockton Educator Growth and Evaluation Network. We're going to talk about consistent standards, expectations, and implementation for teachers and administrators to ensure its use as a primary mechanism for growth and improvement. And again, this comes directly from the DESE, there are our standards that our teachers uh, need to meet. Uh, they're, they're very aware of the rubrics involved in that. Um, we'll continue to provide uh, timelines and expectations for our teachers and administrators. We will prioritize standards and indicators when we, um, for evaluation uh, so our teachers will understand the focus of their teacher growth. We will utilize also this system to recruit the best, uh, to induct, to support, and develop a cadre of highly qualified administrators and educators. We'll provide formal and informal professional development opportunities to support staff in developing and implementing professional and student SMART goals. We'll provide training and support in baseline edge, which will also be provided to our school committee in evaluating the superintendent. Our teachers have already begun their professional development. We will continue with that uh, at the district and school level. Um, we will also promote district-wide collaborative culture of sharing best practices and resources uh, throughout the district and convene our uh, joint labor management task force to determine and negotiate priority standards and indicators. I also want to say here that, um, again, when you talk about our, our own faculty, they will have opportunities in meetings to share um, and trainings to share best practices and reinforce our instructional models. We'll develop a, co a coherent plan, a K-12 curriculum development, implementation, and a revision of our unit design models, recommended instructional practices, assessments and suggested resources and technology. We will provide opportunities for collaborations across levels in the district to align curriculum not only vertically but horizontally and to continue to revise and update our curriculum. We'll also provide a high quality 21st century instruction that is supported with a system of coordinated, responsive, uh, high level targeted professional development in every grade level and in every classroom. We'll do that again through uh, revising our professional development uh, as feedback and suggestions become available, whether that be through surveys with our principals, with our teachers. Um, we'll continue also to provide, most importantly, professional development and support to ensure academic growth, again, of all of our students. Those are our English language learners and our special needs students. Many of you know that our teachers will all be trained in what they call retail which again are best practices for any teacher that has an English language learner in the classroom, which are all our teachers in the Brockton Public Schools. We continue to um, have our teachers trained in retail. We continue to provide uh, best practices for our teachers. And also uh, develop and implement a system to recruit and support highly qualified staff at all levels. Develop and implement an exemplary new teacher induction program. Develop and implement a system to support teachers and evalu evaluators in the ed eval process. Build a database to securely collect and track and store a variety of information, such, such as our ed licensure, our SEI endorsement, our teacher ratings, our attendance of staff, our data, our fingerprinting. All of that information needs to be warehoused in a database with databases that actually talk to each other in the system and to bring that certainly to, to the next level. And most importantly, again, you hear the talk about common planning time for our educators at all levels. One of the things that we have seen is we have common planning time embedded with our middle schools. 
they have opportunities with their associate principals. You heard the presentation back a couple of weeks ago uh, how that time is actually used at our middle school levels. Our goal in the Brockton Public Schools is to make sure all our teachers at the elementary level, at the high school level, have those opportunities for common planning time and to develop professional uh, learning communities. Our strategic plan has a very intentional focus on our youngest learners in Brockton. Our goal for them is that they will be reading proficiently on on grade level by grade three. The other thing that we did was we said we want to make sure that it's not only an early learning um, opportunity, but that we really continue to investigate supports and interventions to ensure that all of our students is that all of our students are on grade level in all core subject areas. We have to do that by looking at what the during the day instruction looks like, but also thinking about opportunities beyond the day, before and after school, tutoring opportunities to make sure that we have the safety nets in place so that all of our students can be on grade level in all core subject areas. And going back to the district review, the uh, pre-K to 12 writing initiative in Brockton was, was recognized as a, as a strong practice because it, because it went across all levels. That's something that we need to continue to expand and also look at the model for reading instruction within the district. Technology and dig digital literacy is a big piece of our plan, um, not only for students but staff as well. Um, we need to continue to look at opportunities for um, getting more technology in the classroom for students and teachers, as well as professional development opportunities that really help the adults get comfortable with teaching with new technology so that they can um, then pass that on to students in a way that's appropriate. Access to technology and enhanced digital, lit digital literacy are essential to this plan. And it's also part of our whole um, plan is evolution as we move towards a next generation assessment, but also get students for college and career. Another consistent theme for us relates to how we use data to inform our decisions within the district and also how we support teachers in their use of data to improve instruction. What data will indicate what we are, whether we are supporting instructional practices effectively? What are we going to look at as a district to make sure that we're on the right track with some of our initiatives? We also need to talk about how we are going to balance assessment with the need for every instructional minute at every single grade level. And we, we, we need to identify what data we will make readily available for schools to assist them in making the best decisions for their students. Data monitoring and reflection will play a big role in our plan in the steps that we take to fulfill the vision of instructional excellence for every student every day in Brockton. Deputy Superintendent Thomas will share with you our strategic objective three. Our goal is to develop a uh, system to provide safe, clean, and engaging learning environments for our students, and not only that involves several departments. Obviously, the facilities department with our custodians and craftsmen working also with um, the assistant principals as far as working to, to make sure um, discipline is, is being handled correctly, and we're doing everything we can to support students and um, trying more interventions to keep them in school and building relationships with the students so things are obviously reported to us that we need to know and obviously that helps keep the building safe. Uh, it also includes our school police that always inform us of, of situations that happen in the community that might spill over into the schools. Um, so, and also our Office of Emergency Management with Tobias. Um, I just recently served on the Governor's Safety and Security Task Force for Schools. Uh, that recommend uh, that has several recommendations on how to improve safety in schools and it includes all of those um, departments working together facilities school school based administration uh, school police and also our community partners as well um, we need obviously as you know to come up with a strategy to refurbish our school buildings as you know we have um, some new schools but our average age of schools is about 50 years old um, we need classrooms renovated, ceilings renovated, we need bathrooms renovated. Um, 
you know, I could tell you off the top of the head, my head that everything that has to be done in these schools, but we need to get the word out. Uh, obviously, this, um, this, this requires funding and support um, from, you know, from the city and from the school side. Uh, but it also involves us working with the MSBA, as we were able to do and secure the last six projects through the MSBA. So we have to need to continue to work with them um, to identify um, the 80% reimbursement to help us complete these things. Um, we also have to, as far as developing a long-term strategy, that's, that's our capital plan. Um, where do we go? Do we, um, what do we do about building one or two new schools? But before you can apply to the MSBA to do that, you have to make sure that you're using your current facilities up to capacity. So we have to basically spend the next year working together um, with the facility subcommittee to, to see, uh, evaluate our current programs and our current buildings. Are we using them to capacity before we can move forward and apply to the MSBA for, um, for new schools? Um, obviously, continue to work to, to, to provide well-organized, clean, and engaging learning environment, environments, and that's again with our custodial staff and the teachers um, and administrations in the building. I think we can move. Oh, and um, next is, I didn't touch on the development in, of multiple pathways for all students. Um, we're looking at, um, especially our eighth graders who are transitioning to the ninth grade, um, we're looking at the champion, expanding the classes over there to um, kind of help with the transition, maybe a year where students who really struggled in the eighth grade, but obviously their age is becoming an issue as we dealt with that last year. Um, maybe they spend a year at a champion and an alternative pathway before moving on to Brockton, a more, uh, Brockton High School, a more traditional high school. They may need that year to, to, to develop and to grow uh, and need some extra wraparound services before they, they move into um, the high school, uh, a regular traditional high school. Or they might end up staying at the Champion. Those things we need to evaluate and work together with the people that provide those services. Um, and, and just to follow up, um, you know, first of all, we do an excellent job, you know, as Deputy Superintendent Thomas started to share with you about our multiple pathways. You know, there's something for every child, whether it's re-engaging, whether it's uh, an evening uh, school, um, whether it's Champion, our guarded school, our B.B. Russell. I mean, there are many opportunities for our students to, again, uh, engage, to get their high school diploma, and be college and career ready, and that will continue to do in our district. When you talk about something that's very important to me, having been uh, not just a former teacher, but a school adjustment counselor, you know, assure a, a safe and nurturing learning environment for our students, and how do we do that? You know, Deputy Thomas r mentions our safe and secure buildings, but also we continue to expand the work of our safe and supportive trauma-sensitive schools, our pro-social curricula for positive behavior interventions, uh, PBIS, our school-wide behavior plans for class management, bullying prevention, uh, exploration of alternatives to in-school suspension, Regularly, regularly monitoring some of the non-academic uh, measures, the, the suspension rates, et cetera. Our students that we have early warning indicator signs of things we can do to prevent them from dropping out and having difficulties in school. We're already going to be doing training on next week on uh, revising a system-wide discipline guide. Um, we'll be sharing with our administrators uh, also to increase time on learning for our students and to investigate and implement policies that maintain high rates of student attendance in our district. Next slide. Yes. Okay, strategic objective number four, uh, support and expand outreach and engagement with parents, family, and the community. Explore and expand new ways to effectively engage our families. You know, w again, ways to do that. We've talked about, um, Cultural proficiency, and, and I'm here to also share with you, as we unveil the strategic plan, I'm excited that one of the projects during a recent administrative internship was the cultural proficiency uh, project. And we'll be sharing with you uh, opportunities for uh, our families and our teachers to certainly understand family and community engagement for bilingual, monolingual, uh, non-English communities. Uh, a family and community engagement plan, a plan for professional development towards the goal of cultural proficiency. So again, these things are already happening in the district. Um, so cultural competence. 
uh, continued the superintendent listening tours and student focus groups. I felt it was so important last year when I was actually out in the district providing opportunities. Last year, I uh, found myself in the middle schools. Uh, I thought it was a good way north, south, east, and west. This year, I'd like to get into some of the elementary schools to get up here to Brockton High School and start to see if we can continue to engage the parents and give them opportunities to talk to the superintendent and our team and to share with them some of their concerns about the Brockton Public Schools and also to continue that with our student groups up here at Brockton High School. To assist our families in navigating and understanding our school system. To empower our families through expanded educational opportunities and advocacy centers. And I know you've heard me talk at length To develop and implement a system to use community and school partnerships to ensure every parent and community member understands the importance of academic achievement, knows specific ways that they can assist their children so that they, their children can become successful students, and to know and understand why a range of specific strategies that they can use at home to help their children in learning. Um, again, these could be uh, provide newsletter for parents. Uh, grade level uh, family letters home uh, about what their children will be working on in school, website with suggested acti activities for families, uh, museum events, community theaters, cultural events, summer programs, continue to make sure that that's a priority and we don't certainly miss that, that with all of our priorities there is that time for the family to be those teachers for our students. And lastly, we'll talk about strengthening the partnerships with community agencies stakeholders, institutions of higher education to encourage students to pursue college and career pathways and opportunities. Um, one of the things we, and we've already, again, we're out there meeting with Bridgewater State University, Massasoit Community College, Stonehill, to provide opportunities for our students. One of the programs that we'll be talking about very soon is a Grow Your Own. You've heard me talk about that certainly during my interview process, during the entry planning. We will be bringing the colleges together to talk about in a grow your own model and looking at the diversity of our certified teaching staff. One of the ways to do that is to develop future teacher clubs to make sure that we're encouraging those students as they come up through the levels to see a career in education, to come back and work with us, whether it's through loan forgiveness, whether it's working with the colleges to establish programs for our juniors and seniors while they're at Brockton High School to encourage them to go into education. Um, so again, all of this uh, strengthens our partnership with, with the communities, with additional stakeholders, and certainly benefits uh, our students. Um, and that is uh, the unveiling tonight of the beginning of our strategic plan. And as I said, I want to reiterate again, as we shared with you tonight our vision, our mission, our theory of action, we will be working with the school committee to look at, through our strategic plan, what is our district improvement plan. And again, I talked about the periodic reports to the school committee on the progress of our district improvement plan. But I want you to see the trickle-down effect, that this plan also informs what's happening with our school improvement plans. It is their framework for raising student achievement and to address our diverse needs in the Brockton Public Schools. What my expectations are with the school improvement plans at each of our schools is that they will be effectively communicated with our families and our students in our schools. Our school councils, along with our principals, will report to their school community and their teachers not only the success of the district improvement plan, but of their school improvement plans. And I can't say it enough that the strategic plan, our district improvement plan, will be shared widely this year. Every opportunity I have, every group that I talk to, because when you start to do that, people understand how the Brockton Public Schools operates. And when I spoke before the City Council on June 9th, one of the things I said, and I'll say it again, is this community expects excellence. So we will continue to do that. 
Um, again, I hope this is a plan that you will adopt. And I thank everybody again that had, had part in the process. And uh, again, you're able to, to look at our, I think our attractive and motivating logo for the evening. So thank you. Questions? I'm wondering a little bit, uh, first of all, this is incredible. I think it's super comprehensive. I was able to sit in on a lot of the uh, listening sessions and you know we've been, been hearing bits and pieces about this for so long. I think to kind of see it all together is, is really great. Um, I was wondering about kind of, and, and you don't have to speak specifically to this tonight, but some, I guess, food for thought, specific measures of success. Right, I hear about all the things that we want to do, um, and I'd I'd like to at some point be able to hear more about how how are we going to know if they were actually successful, right? So one of the things we want to do is get our website in multiple languages, right? The hope I imagine of that is so that more people come to our website, more people utilize it. Um, so do we know how many people are now, and and then mm -hmm. when we change the languages, do we know how many people are after, so we can tell if that was something that worked. Um, versus just the thing that worked was that we did it. <laughs> Not that it actually bore the results that we wanted. Um, and I think with something like a website, it's easy. I think it gets harder. You know, I've sat with Sal and other folks on the trauma-sensitive learning and, and, and some of those things. You know, what are measures of success around increasing student supports? Is it that more students are feeling comfortable accessing our nurses' offices? You know, bringing, uh, you know, requests for support, whether it's academic or in their home life, mm -hmm. to our schools and our principals, um, classroom teachers. Are we prepared and capable of responding to those things? What are our goals in doing the things that are outlined yeah, yeah. here? And, and a little bit about like where we are now with some of those things and where we hope to be, right? Yeah. So, you know, again, I, I'm not asking you to throw out, no, like, no, we want to increase it from 50 to 80% yeah. right now, no, but I'd love I, for us to start to think in that frame a little bit. I think with any good strategic plan, and when I talk about meeting with the school committee in our retreat, one of the things that we will talk about are timelines and benchmarks. So those benchmarks are exactly that. What is the data that we will collect? And as I said to you, every school committee meeting, it, it's great for me to talk about teaching and learning, what's happening in the district, but all of that will relate to this strategic plan. What have we been able to accomplish? What is the data? We talk about very simply, um, I talked about advocacy centers for special education and bilingual families. So who's using the advocacy centers? You know, are we doing trainings with the parents? Are we increasing the people that come to a PAC meeting, that come to a CPAC meeting? That to me, again, is the data that we will collect yeah. and we'll be able to see on every one of these initiatives. What are the benchmarks and are we successful? And if we're not, that's not where we put our, our money that's not a priority in our budget, and that's why I talked about it being a very fluid document yeah. and something that we continue to revise. Yeah, I mean, I, think, I guess as I think about it being a fluid document, that would be something that would be useful, I think, to us as school committee members as we review budgets. But, you know, not necessarily meaning that we should bail on a sp specific strategy, but maybe, okay, we implemented this strategy with this intent, right? We wanted to create this change by doing this. Where were we at before? Where were we at six months later, a year later? Are we creating the change that we set out to? Are we creating other changes that we didn't even anticipate? Some good, some bad maybe, a mix of both. And, and if so, then what do we need to change about this to get the desired outcome? Or, or what is it, um, or, or do we need to find a whole new strategy to get us there, right? And, and I think sometimes those are the pieces that are missing. I, I get to work with a lot of different communities in my professional life, and sometimes communities are satisfied by doing stuff, not by, figuring out whether what they actually did created the intended results. Um, sometimes they don't even think about what the intended results are. We just need to do something, right? Because there's something happening, we need to respond to it, so let's do it. And once we have did it, that was the success, right? Not did we create the results that we wanted from what we tried to do. And, and if we didn't create the results, what can we change? If we did create the results, then how can we increase it to even get better results, you know, move us to the next place? One of the things I had also uh, stated to you is, you know, we have the principals coming back, we have our department heads, our, our administrators, our teachers. You know, we want to make sure there's buy-in. This isn't just a document that is going to sit there. You know, we'll continue to report to you. 
There still could be changes to this. There could be additions. Um, I really don't see many things you know, being deleted. Uh, we try to honor the report from the district review, and I hope what you heard. Um, I have documents I'll give out to you tonight. I think you'll find this very interesting. Um, it'll show you some of the emerging themes that we had during the entry plan. So there was all of that information gathering that I shared with you. We also have in a second column, what were the challenges that were presented to us through the district review? And lastly, how is the strategic plan addressing the challenges from the district review? And you'll see it all line up. And again, we'll continue to look at this as we go forward to see if we have been you know, faithful to what we said we would be doing. Great, thank you. Uh, great though. Um, this is a really great uh, piece of document here. Um, the question, I guess, comment I would have is one of the emerging themes I see is technology. And I think one of the things we have to focus on as a school committee for, you know, the next budget season, because we have made really, really tough decisions uh, this budget season, basically gutting the technology department. Uh, we will have to focus on working with you to figure out a way to get the technology in those classrooms and um, so we can meet these objectives. So that would just be my comment. And, on and that's that. very true. You know, we, we talk <coughs> and I'll tell you some of my frustration this summer is I'm out there and people saw what we went through this past spring. And there were people that will come up to me and they will say to me, you know, oh good, you know, you got your teachers back and, and you're ready to roll and no, that's not the case. And the reason I say that is when you bring up instructional technology, not only the technology itself, which every year we go back and it's a million dollars that we cut right away versus preparing our teachers for that next generation of testing, not only testing, you know, we talked about succeeding in a global economy or society. Uh, but the other thing we have is that additional teacher, which I should have in every one of the schools, focusing on those instructional strategies for teachers to be able to use technology in the classroom. So, so you're right when you say that. Uh, and it was difficult tonight when you talk about the strategic plan, there are so many budget implications. But if we have this, I feel confident when I go before the city council, when I talk to the mayor, and I did talk to the mayor today. I did share some things with the mayor you know, about tonight's presentation, concerns I have. I like the fact that I'll have this document that we've adopted that the DESE, again, has, has said there are some challenges here. This, to me, gives us leverage. And it's leverage that the community has to identify what do they want for their children in the city of Brockton. And now I have a document that says, this is what we think that'll give us instructional excellence for all our children. And what are you willing to do to support that? And I'm willing to be out there. As I said, I don't care if it's the city council. I don't care if it's citizens for limited taxation. I look forward to talking to those people if this is what they want for our school system and our children and our future and those people that come and buy homes and support our city. I think this is great leverage for us, but I I'm glad you bring that up. And I, I can't tell you what will happen in the next budget, but I'll tell you we'll continue to advocate out there. Thank you. I think you've done a fantastic job with this, um, it's very comprehensive, it's far reaching, and I think it's identified exactly what we want our school system to look like. But I do wanna expand a little bit on what Andy uh, brought up because um, I think he did, he really hit the nail on the head. I, th I think the success of this is going to be in how we measure its success at the classroom level. If this doesn't turn, work down to the classroom and, and change how the classroom looks, then we're not gonna be successful in this plan. A couple of the things that um, Ms. Barry brought up was a couple of the items that the district review uh, identified as, as challenges, the higher order thinking and problem solving skills, the, the uh, delivering of rigorous and engaging lessons at the classroom level, and developing and implementing support so that every child is re reading on grade level by uh, third grade. So my question is, what measures are you going to institute, or what mechanisms are you going to institute to measure the success of those initiatives at the classroom level? Um, and I know that that's a, it's a little early that, to answer that, but I think that that's gonna be something that we'll be looking to, to see as we go forward with this and, and how you're going to measure the success. 
as we go on, not at the end of third grade, but you know, from when they enter school, are they on track? You know, what strategies are being used in the classroom to measure that success? Um, I, the only thing that I'll speak to just in general mm -hmm. is that um, I couldn't agree more. One of the things that needs to happen here is that we've got some proposed action steps under the strategic initiative. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> And um, they're proposed because in the spirit um, by which the, the plan was actually created, we worked on, uh, on it together. So to make sure that, that it doesn't just become a book on a shelf, we really need to work on the action steps together um, within departments, within levels. And when we're talking about proposed action steps, you know, to, to fulfill that strategic initiative, I think that one of our questions really needs to be, if this is an action step, what does it look like, you know, one month, two months, three right. months down the road? How do we measure it? How do we know if it's working? Mm -hmm. And that will have to be that link that we make to action steps that we actually commit to mm -hmm. um, among levels and also within departments. And it's actually about changing the culture and making this part of the fabric in the classroom. So I would, you know, I would be looking to see how the classroom dynamic changes through the implementation of these initiatives. Right. But it's, it's um, a great report, and I think it gives us a really great jumping off spot, you know. Uh, Mrs. Joyce, uh, again, when you, when you bring that up, and I couldn't agree with you more, and when, when I think about how this all comes together, you know, it, it starts with, again, the hiring of a teacher. You know, and, and, and as uh, Liz Barry said, you know, it's, it's part of our action steps. You know, when we hire a highly qualified teacher, what do we do then? Do we give them a strong induction program? Do we make sure they have opportunities through common planning time with other teachers at their level? You know, to have conversation about best practices, about higher order thinking skills, about things that are working in classrooms, having opportunities to go into other classrooms, to, to share things again, to, to look at uh, not only benchmark testing, which is done all the time for these students, to be able to look at your teaching and refine what's happening in the classroom. So, so it is a big picture. It's all about professional development. It's all about working with our principals and our teachers and talking to them about what do they need professional development in. Um, and, and we'll continue to do this. I'm, I, I'm actually excited about this. As I said, I think it gives us a direction it gives us something to continue to work with. Um, it gives uh, Liz Barry and her team of teaching and learning uh, with June Sabe with the elementary principals, Cliff Murray with our middle school, Sharon Wolder has joined our executive team. I'm really excited about what they're gonna be able to do. And the thing I keep saying to you, we are a school district. We're not just a district of schools, we're a very strong school district where the time is right where we start to articulate between elementary that has conversations with the middle schools about what worked, what doesn't work as the kids go up through, through the different levels. They have conversations with the high school. It's what will continue to make us strong. But as I said, it's when we look at this whole strategic plan, it involves so many pieces coming together. As I said, the hiring, the professional development that we do with our staff, the continual, a continuous improvement is what it is, a continuous improvement plan for the district. and how we set our priorities on, on where we spend our money. We had to cut professional development this year. You know, and we've identified that that's a critical area, but we had to cut that this year to, to be able to keep our teachers in the classroom. There's and decisions and to be made. And I will tell you, uh, when we did that, one of the concerns that I had when, when you start to look at a dollar figure, if you do professional development after school hours, on a Saturday, on an election day, you know, there's a high price tag you know, for that in any district, not just the Brockton Public Schools. So one of the things we did this year is we looked at some of those half-day models. And we're gonna continue to look at that. You know, it, make no mistake about it, when, when I interviewed back so long ago at this point, one of the things I talked about and had researched all about the amount of time it takes for teachers to truly, any profession, to improve their practice is through that professional development model. So we will continue to look at every way we can do that. Um, we had a meeting today to again, talk about foundations that support supporting our teachers in that way. And as I said, we, 
we're looking at grants, we're looking at foundations, and, and, and having this strategic plan also benefits us with a lot of these funders to say we have a plan, we know what we want to do, we're an urban district, we're a gateway city, fund us, we know how to do that kind of work. So that, again, is what is so important about having a, an adopted strategic plan. And just one more comment um, for Mike on the facilities uh, initiatives and what you had mentioned about um, having, when we go to the state for funding, we have to prove to the state that we're utilizing our facilities to the best that we can in the most effective way that we can. And we've made steps, and the mayor has given his support for funding a, a master facilities plan that we is going to be critical going forward in funding additional schools with the MSBA. Um, I'd like to know, do we have an update on where we stand on that? Has he, has he, um, we, Have we you presented to the city council <coughs> on that? Not yet. They approved the 130000 for the feasibility study. So what happens after that is the, um, they do the study on the, um, for the six projects. And basically, they, an architect, an engineer, they put a price tag on right. what it's going to cost. But he's also talking about a facilities map. Yeah, well, this plan. is where it plays. And then you go back okay. to the city council. Mm -hmm. Um, with the price tag of the MSBA project. At that time, the city council make to, makes a decision because obviously they have to bond that. Okay. So what the mayor was going to do was, was going to bond the, the 250000 with that project, even though yeah. Yeah. it was almost like how we did the stadium the last time. That we didn't get 80% reimbursement for the stadium, and you won't get 80% reimbursement for a facilities master plan, you, um, but it will be bonded in with that with that money that so the city can afford to pay for it. Yeah. So okay. that's where we, we have to wait. Basically, before we can go back in front of the city council to ask mm -hmm. for that, um, we have to wait for the feasibility study to come back from the MSBA, which will probably be sometime okay. in early November. Okay. So they'll, they'll spend this um, fall looking at, um, early fall, looking at those, those projects. And once they put the price tag, we can go back and then we talk about the yeah, next the phase. The sooner that we can move forward with that, the sooner we can start to look at our, our structure um, as, as a district and where we're utilizing our, our buildings and where we have deficiencies and what we need going forward. Yeah, and I think we should start bef maybe before we, we, we maybe start with an early facility subcommittee meeting in yeah. September to start looking at, again, they want us, and, and they'll ask us these questions when they do a facilities master plan is, okay, um, are you, all your buildings to capacity now? Yeah. Um, so I think we can start looking at yeah, within. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mike. I love the vision. Um, I think that the vision, you know, gives kind of a focal point, and it can really motivate everyone from administration, the teachers, students, and parents to um, become a even stronger school system. It's a great job. Thank you, Judy. I know that there's a lot of ways to, you know, measure educational goals and achievements. Um, but one thing you focus on is bullying in the social aspect as well. Um, I was just wondering how you know, measures or programs, you know, not necessarily tonight, but in the future, if you could get back to us with programs and measures for that, for social development, for our English language learners, our special needs students, how you're going to empower those students um, and show visible achievements and, and that aspect, as well as the um, bullying and empowering students to um, not be victimized by other students and to empower themselves. Uh, you know I taught special <laughs> needs students, and you're absolutely right. You know, whether we like it or not, kids pick on each other. It's a, is it a rite of passage? It's, it's not okay, and, and kids have to feel good about themselves in, in so many ways and be able to to not be victimized. I think um, one of the most important things, again, Deputy Superintendent Barry shared with you, is as we go forward and we start to work with our different departments on proposed action steps, so while there'll be action step steps for schools on looking at classroom <coughs> management, bullying prevention, we also will look at those special populations. We'll have conversations with Laurie Mason and her department as to how they fit in with all of these, again, proposed uh, initiatives and what will their action steps be. 
you know, we're, we're looking, and, and this budget has been difficult. I, 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 one of the things I've said to you is I'm looking to bring on a cultural proficiency specialist, and, and this report is wonderful. I, I'm just getting through it. I just got back from vacation. Um, we had three administrative interns. They all happened to be school adjustment counselors, uh, Gary Guiato, uh, Jari Alverne, uh, Maria Lobo Andrade. Uh, they just did a super job because, again, we, we deal with many, many different cultures. Our teachers need to understand how to deal, you know, with the different cultures to understand their involvement or lack of involvement in school isn't because they're not interested. And that being said, also, we have to make sure we're protecting those that are newest to our country to make sure that these things aren't happening to those students. So we'll, we'll continue to look at this, as I said. It isn't just for particular schools. It also uh, is interdepartmental to look at all of these different initiatives. Report. I, um, on the... Uh, assessment component, I think that um, at the beginning of all the school years in that first semester, um, it's critical at all levels, um, not only between elementary, middle, and high school, but within a, a school at a certain level itself, for teachers to communicate or report in to their administration um, a assessment that they make regarding the readiness of the students that they have now inherited. And basically, for instance, um, sixth graders. Well, at the middle school level, I think this is a perfect opportunity for the first uh, term for across the board for teachers to say, okay, this is what we found. Our, the, the, sixth graders that I'm receiving this year are either well prepared with this, this, and this, or you know what, there's a deficiency within the system because I'm finding that my kids do not know, you know, whatever it is, you know, decimals or fractions or this or that at every single level. I mean, it, the first term I think is a critical opportunity for the system to assess itself. A, a third grade teacher being as, or the third grade level, let's just say at the Hancock, so in saying, you know what, these second graders that I inherited are not where I think they should be. We need to focus at that. So each level, each, again, elementary, middle, and high school should be able to, that first term, assess and basically self-assess the system and, and the preparedness of the kids they're inheriting that following year. I actually think that's, that's an excellent uh, recommendation. Um, in talking to uh, June Saber McGuire and uh, Dr. Murray, one of the things that I know they're going to do along with Sharon Wolder is they're going to have those kinds of meetings where they're actually surveying principals, bringing principals together. I think what your suggestion is to take a look at the teacher level and have them be sharing with their principals and again with our Office of Teaching and Learning some of those concerns that they have. Um, so as I said, I, I know it's something we're trying to put in place to have that, that articulation you know, between well, our different right. levels, but, but I hear what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, uh, the way I viewed your presentation, maybe I viewed more into it, or maybe I think within your framework, there is room to incorporate something mm -hmm. like that. You know? that horizontal articulation yeah. between the grade levels, between the, level, the levels themselves, elementary, middle, and high school, but also within that, the, the schools at the right. certain level themselves. I mean. Well, it certainly empowers the teachers, but, but I also want you to know that we're already getting information in on MCAS. It's very preliminary. You know, we're, we're already looking at it. We're getting prepared for the principals coming in. So in the Office of Teaching and Learning, they're doing that all the time. They're looking at through testing, through benchmarks, you know, where are our deficiencies in grade two by means of testing, you know, or the grade three or grade four, et cetera. So we're doing that, but I think you make a really good suggestion of the teachers that are sitting there with first graders that came from kindergarten or sixth graders coming to the first time at a middle school. Rather than finger pointing, and that's why I said we are a strong school district, we're not a district of schools. 
we need schools, we need teachers talking to each other so that we can continue to improve together and to be comfortable with looking at what we need to do better. And, and I feel very good about what we have set up. Uh, we've, uh, you heard me talk about unveiling this plan. And when I said to you, while I support and am and, and very confident that we will get back all of our employees that make a difference, I'm not going to lose sight of the fact that in the Office of Teaching and Learning, you have set us up with an administration that is going to work with the teachers along with our high school to make sure that instruction is what it needs to be at every one of our levels for every student. Um, the school system, in particular, Ethan always provides us with honest assessment mm -hmm. um, data. Um, we've always had that. I mean, so yes, we do see what's happening at the different levels, but I just think that that conversation between teachers and their building administrator th that then can translate into a uh, meeting and or discussion with a Mr. Murray or a Ms. Saber at that level, that conversation between the teacher, I think, and the administrator, hearing from the teacher what they are, what they are observing, what they think should have happened or how, I, I just think aside from just looking at test scores, the conversation mm -hmm. amongst the staff, I think, will bear positive fruit. I just, I, I agree with you. I think that what you're talking about is those soft measures and what teachers know and what they feel at the beginning of the year. One of the things that we do K-8 to is we actually have an assessment system that allows us to utilize formative assessment three times a year. So when students go into a new grade level, their assessment in reading and math in the STAR system, which is a system that we adopted fully K-8 to last year, will allow for very incremental distinctions to be made where a student um, is struggling, where a student's strengths are, um, so that teachers will actually have that data for the students that they inherit. Um, and then what will take place at the beginning of the school year is we will do a benchmark assessment so that they will assess the students at the beginning of the year because learning loss does tend to happen over the summer. So we're talking about those formal assessment measures and the kind of credence we give that but then also how are we providing for those opportunities for teachers to say this is what I know and feel isn't right or these are strengths that I see. Um, <clears throat> and I think that we can absolutely support that balance and begin to work towards articulation at those levels. Great. One of the things we're already doing and, and we'll be sharing with you, we had talked about that kindergarten age. And the one thing that we said is, you know, regardless of how we feel about four-year-olds coming to school in September, you know, until they come up with a preschool program, we need those four-year-olds coming to school in September. But what we're looking to do in each one of our schools, no matter about a difficult budget time, we're looking to take those so-called burr babies. And every time I say that, there, I, I'm surprised. So again, in, in our culture of burr babies, you're talking September, October, November, December, you know, our late birthdays. We're looking to, to have a classroom in every school that those students have a smaller class size, which is what we talked about last February, and also uh, there certainly will be certain, certain teaching methods, but I'm saying that because one of the things that Deputy Superintendent Barry and I talk about often is, it's not that every child belongs in that kind of a classroom. There could be some students that are far beyond that. They could be emerging readers, but it gives us an opportunity to provide supports and to provide an opportunity for the teachers to talk about those very things. There might be a student that is a January birthday but could use that classroom environment, those kinds of strategies. So we're continuing to do that and, and implementing it from the very youngest student, uh, but I think it's a great suggestion. Mm -hmm. But it is something that we're, we're certainly looking at. Uh, Andy? Yeah, and I don't want to be late, we're late but you know, I, I hear Mr. Minichello talk and it's you know, the, kind of the difference between that, those qualitative measures and the quantitative measures. Mm -hmm. And when I'm looking like at, at the strategic plan, you know, in my mind, when you look at something like student support, students feeling safe, creating, you know, meeting the emotional needs of students when you're talking about something like engagement, two, two out of the three of our focus areas are really, how do you measure quantitatively, you know, whether a student feels safe? You, you know, you can pull numbers, right? How many absences they have? Okay. Where, are they on time for school every day? Uh, discipline records, but but you know you're really getting at something that you can't measure based on a test. And I, I start to think about how the two 
affect e and impact each other, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we can take these great qualitative measure or quantitative measures. You know, we got so math testing that happens all the time and, and all these things. And then, you know, they'll tell you something about where a student is at, but they don't necessarily tell you why that student is there, mm -hmm. right? And, 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 you know, we sit in meetings and, you know, you think about, is that student there because they're not getting, you know, they don't have the right teacher in front of them or the teacher that's in front of them doesn't have the skills that they need to help a student, you know, who's struggling mm -hmm. um, or th that particular kind of student? Or is it something totally unrelated to the teacher in the classroom right. that's impacting that student? And, and that speaks to, so you know, parent engagement and, and sense of safety and, and social emotional supports and need, right? And, and, I mean, so the, the, they're so integrated and, and, they'll, and, and, you know, that's my concern, I guess, when I voiced initially this idea of what are our measures? Mm -hmm. Because some of the things you're talking about are, I don't know what the measures for them are, <laughs> but we have to have some measures in place to figure out right. if we're making any progress. Um, and, and maybe the first time around we'll choose the wrong measures or maybe we'll choose the wrong, you know, strategies. Mm -hmm. um, maybe some combination of both. Um, but I'd like to know, you know, that what we're trying to do is having some kind of impact. impact. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and having the impact where we intend it mm -hmm. to take place. And then to start to think about how all the pieces impact each other, mm -hmm. right? I mean, as we start to make students feel safer and as we start to meet their social and emotional needs, I'm convinced we will see a bump in our test scores we, immediately. It, it will happen because some of our students simply aren't achieving because they don't have the social and emotional supports mm -hmm. that they need. Mm -hmm. Not because they're incapable or the teachers are incapable, right. but simply because they don't feel supported. And, mm -hmm. and, and you know, those are hard things to kind of mm -hmm. tie up nice and neat in, in, a, in a report. And you guys worked incredibly hard and I don't want to but, but you know, I, I think there's a lot of critical thinking that needs to happen mm -hmm. still. Um, and, and how we determine whether or not we're being effective test scores and level one schools versus level four schools is one way. Um, you know, absences and, you know, enrollment in pathways programs is another. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a whole other level that I think we've really struggled for a long time to get at. Um, and and the, the, the student support and the engagement piece, I think, will start to hit on it if we do it well. Thank you. Okay. You went over the 15 minute limit that you gave each. <laughs> I didn't think we had the 15 minutes. Oh, all right, you got 17. Hmm. Ethan should be offended. Okay. Items to refer to subcommittee. Are there any items that anyone would like to refer to subcommittee this evening? What is um, our retreat? Um, yes, we were um, talking about having the retreat sometime in September, correct? Please. So, um, mm -hmm. All right, so if people could, um, we won't pick the date tonight, but if people could just think about September, um, we don't want to have it. Um, during Alicia's honeymoon, uh, <laughs> so um, we'll um, we'll wait till September for that. Um, but just look at your calendars and see what dates would be free. Um, okay, uh, new business. Oh, unfinished business. Superintendent's evaluation. Yes, the superintendent's evaluation. Everyone in their packet received a an evaluation tool. It. Um, did everyone see that in their packets? Okay. Um, so um, the tool is very similar to the one that we received um, probably a month and a half ago. Um, and the superintendent just um, made a couple of variations. But um, I think it's self-explanatory. But there um, is supporting material as is required uh, under the new guidelines. Um, some of it is here. and. The superintendent will have it all available. Uh, I brought some updated documents and the binders. Um, and, and also, I, I think I, I didn't mention this, so this year uh, was pretty definitive about a new superintendent coming in. Goals were set by the DESE. This strategic plan during our retreat in September will certainly, we will sit and I will make recommendations and I'd like to hear from you 
uh, as far as um, I will go through the evaluation process in a very different way of choosing goals for the superintendent based on what you expect to see happen this year in the strategic plan. So if um, time is of the essence, yeah, time is because of the we essence. do want to. I, I'm so proud of the work that's been done in the district on our 100% educator evaluation ratings being given to the Department of Education. I wasn't sure that was something that could happen, and understand we were very much under the microscope. Um, so um, they're saying that mine is the last one to be submitted. So if people could um, try to have this completed by sometime next week and submit the packet to the superintendent's office, then I'll compile the information um, with either Wanda or Donna, and then um, we will have a uh, report that incorporates all the averages. Is Wanda collecting, or should we send it to you, Tom? Um, well, if you can send it to my email address, that would be great. Okay. And and then I'll compile it all. And, and next year you'll be on baseline edge. Everything once we develop the plan, all of it goes on baseline edge. You'll have yeah. it all year long. If you can do it electronically, that's fine. Whatever you feel com whatever you feel comfortable with. Yeah, whatever. Because we'll just print out a copy of it, you know, to yeah. have uh, for a permanent like a record. Permanent file, yeah. Well, we need to, you know, it has to be incorporated. Then we'll have a public hearing um, and um, go from there. We just need to do electronic documents and send it to one so That's fine. Anything else on that? Um, I just want to remind everybody, a uh, city council meeting uh, on August 18th, Monday evening. Uh, it'll be the report that was going to be given on the 21st of July. Um, they've also asked for information on the uh, diversity in our hiring practices. So I'm glad we unveiled the strategic plan this evening. I'll talk to the city council about it. And the other thing is we have a school committee photo scheduled for sub the September 16th meeting. I think we had been holding off for Ozzy to come on board. The new school committee came on board in January, um, but we obviously were waiting for to have a full membership. Do you have a time for that city council meeting? Aldo, do you have a time for that city council meeting, Aldo? So what, are you? 7, 7 p.m. p.m.? Yeah. Okay. Mrs. Joyce, did you have your hand up? It is 7 p.m. Yeah. yeah, it is 7 p.m. in the City Council Chamber at City Hall. Things that you send us in the Friday packet. Yeah. Thank you. Um, new business? Yeah, new business. New business. Um, we do have um, Summerfest. You want to talk about Summerfest? Well, you know, you've been busy presenting, you know. <laughs> this is, I have to think of how many years it is. I, I think this is our fourth year of, of a revised Summerfest. Um, hopefully we have great weather. Uh, it is this coming Saturday, the 16th, uh, on the grounds of Brockton High School. Um, you've got a lot of schools involved, a lot of community agencies involved, uh, great time. I don't know if any of you attended last year. There was a, an art um, exhibit. Uh, um, you know, there were certainly activities for families and kids, and it, it was it was very well attended. So if you have an opportunity to bring your families there and get out, it's it's a great event. And there's been a lot of hard work. Uh, Jean Mech, I see Scott Holmes here. Uh, numbers of people have certainly spent a year planning for this Saturday. I think it starts at ten. 10 to 4? A um, couple of things. Um, my Patty and I went to the Act 1, Scene 1 uh, program. It was phenomenal. And um, Wanda's um, granddaughter was a star in it. And um, it was so entertaining. Um, there were, was there like 300 kids? Close? 
two or three. About 110. Oh, there were tons of kids, lots of kids at a all. Little, a little. <laughs> lots of kids everywhere, kids, kids, um, all different levels, and they were really incredible. I mean, this, we are going to be in such good shape with our drama department because we had so many good singers. These kids could sing, um, some great voices. And they certainly can act. Um, so it was a great event, um, very entertaining. Um, the other thing I just want to compliment on is the, um, I don't know if people participate, but the Manning and the Cosgrove pools. Um, the Public Properties Department basically takes care of those two pools. And those, the quality of that water has been pristine all summer long. And so many kids have used those pools. Um, the condition of the pools. Um, the Cosgrove is older. They do the best they can with that. Um, but I was um, up at the Manning one morning, and the state was there doing an inspection. And they were so impressed and asking our Brockton guys what products they're using, um, what, they're, um, what they used for paint, because that pool got repainted over the winter. They were just floored by how good a shape these pools were. And he even commented on the Cosgrove and said, you know, it is an older pool, but these guys are doing a great job with, you know, what they have. Um, so a lot of kids have been using those, uh, those pools this year, and they've just done a great job. Um, so anyone else? No? Okay. Um, well, we need a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second? Okay. Thank you for attending.